Welcome to the Fort Johnson Podcast. I'm your host, and today we acknowledge a professional group of people whose work keeps skies safe and efficient, air traffic controllers. It just so happens that October 20th marks the International Air Traffic Controller Day. So today we'll highlight the important role these unsung, hero plays, these unsung heroes play in maintaining our global airways organized and our flight safe. From tracking several thousand aircraft in real time to making critical decisions at a moment's notice, air traffic controllers are indispensable to this industry. Whether you fly to see your family, for work, or on a mission, chances are your safety was in their hands. So take a seat, get comfortable, and let's take off into the world of air traffic control. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whenever you are watching our podcast, I am Jeff England from the Fort Johnson Public Affairs Office, and we're in the Port, Fort, Port, Fort, Port, Port, Fort, Fort Johnson uh, Public Affairs Podcast Studio. That's what it is, it was the podcast studio. <laughs> anyway, today with me, I've got some air traffic controllers and some guy from DBTMS uh, who likes to tag along every so often. Mark Leslie, how are you doing today? Good morning, Jeff. <laughs> Great to be here. Great to have you back. I appreciate you helping me out with our, with our show all the time and, and being a, a wonderful guest all the time. Yeah, Coming thank in. you. Yeah, that's why I invite you back. Yeah. yeah, thanks for letting me in your studio and bringing my great air traffic. Yes, I team. noticed we got two people over here. We got uh, we got John Fusilier, 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 Fusilier. Fusilier. You're never gonna get it. Fusilier. <laughs> Fusilier. Fusilier. Oh, it's got to be French or it's <laughs> <Right>. Canadian. <laughs> and we got Corey just Claire. How you doing, guys? I appreciate you coming in. Good morning. Thanks Good morning. for having us. <laughs> so, uh, first of all, let me uh, start off by wishing you a happy uh, international international because there's two international uh, air traffic controller day. Thank you. <laughs> So uh, I, I'm glad that you guys were able to take off some uh, some hard work time to get over here and talk to us or uh, talk to me. I mean, it, uh, Mark doesn't like to be talked to. <laughs> <laughs> they talk to me more than they want to, believe me. <laughs> so uh, why don't we get right into it and, and uh, why don't you take us through um, all the different jobs because air traffic control, um, as people out there don't, realize or, or they know that I've actually mentioned that I'm, I'm former Air Force, but I was actually in an air traffic control squadron and my stepfather was an air traffic controller who just happened to be in that group of air traffic controllers that were uh, fired by Ronald Reagan. Mm, I remember that. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so does he. <laughs> So uh, there are multiple places or multiple uh, work or positions over at air traffic control. Uh, and it's not just the tower. So it's, uh, there's more to it than that. You want to take us through a couple of the, the jobs that you guys have to do over there? Sure. So we have the uh, air traffic control radar facility. And then we have the tower, which every, most people think everything air traffic control is a tower. But um, the majority of air traffic control is actually controlled through the radar approach control. Tower is basically from the surface to 2,500 in a five mile circle. And then radar approach control is just depending on what Houston, for, at least for the Department of the Army, it's whatever the FAA is gonna delegate you the airspace. So it could be 20 miles across, it could be 100 miles across. Oh man, 100 miles across would be a, a real pain. There's a lot of planes in there. Which is what- A we lot mean. of aircraft, because it's not just planes, it's, it's yeah. airplanes, it's uh, helicopters, UFOs, birds, everything. That's right. <laughs> it's, we actually have one, the, the largest uh, airspace for the Department of the Army. Oh, crazy. Uh, here at Fort Johnson. Well, we got we've got a really big area with the the JRTC, uh, all of Pison Ridge and the bombing range, and and then then we get out until Alexandria, and they've got a tower, a nice big one. That's right. <laughs> yeah. What what a lot of people don't realize is that uh, Fort Johnson has the largest delegated airspace in the Army, and I think it's the only installation, right, John, that has delegated airspace? No, sir. So there's several that have delegated airspace, but the, the size of our airspace that we have is is the largest. Yep. So without that airspace, um, if we didn't have that airspace, we couldn't do what we do here at the Joint Readiness Training Center. So these guys and what they do actually put the J, the joint, in the Joint Readiness Training Center. If we have to turn that airspace over, 
uh, the, we couldn't do our mission here. It'd be impossible. So we, we couldn't fire any rounds. We couldn't drop any bombs. We couldn't fly any fast-moving aircraft. We couldn't, we couldn't really do what we have to. We'd be no different than any other installation. The fact that we have that airspace is what gives us the unique capabilities to make us the, the great training facility that we are. Yeah, well, I've seen the, the planes that come through, which have nothing to do with Fort Johnson. I mean, we're all helicopters here, but the, uh, I mean, I've seen C-130s and F-15s and F-16s, B-52s, B-1s. Um, I tried seeing a uh, B-2, but uh, it was it was invisible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You'll so, see the results of it on the other end. Oh, yeah, I don't want to be anywhere near that. <laughs> so, so, Corey, how long have you been working here at Fort Johnson? Here at Fort Johnson, 23 years, and I was at Fort Seal prior, so 24 years with the Army total as a controller. Oh, wow, that's crazy. That's a, that's a long time. I and, enjoy it. And I, and I see that you're not wearing glasses, so... Uh, uh, I do wear glasses, I just don't have them on. Right. Oh, okay, so it, it's the little blips on the radar uh, screen. Is like, yeah, <laughs> I, need them, I need them for that. <laughs> So I okay. So you get, you said that there's um, the multiple uh, the the tower is only for like you said twenty five hundred feet or twenty whatever. Um, it's usually just what you can see out those windows, basically. Correct. Correct. Yeah, and uh, I saw a map on on Facebook. You know, you get all kinds of stuff on Facebook, but the uh, but it's a map of the United States if uh, our states were uh, air traffic control uh, sections, and there's like seven or eight something like that you got houston which is forever there's, i think houston goes all the way up into space there's uh, there's 24 centers that across the united states 24 centers yeah so that it starts at the tower goes to a terminal approach control facility like we have and then we then it transfers into the houston center area and then they get aircraft to transition across the united states and then it, to go back down it goes back through the center approach control and in the tower. Oh, that's that's how it works. Yeah, I've seen the, um, I think the big ones are uh, Houston, mm -hmm. Dallas, uh, Chicago, uh, LAX, or Los Angeles, New York. No, yep. New York, is it? Oh, okay. Uh, They're small, but they got yeah. a lot of airplanes in that <laughs> small amount of airspace. Miami. Yep. Miami, yeah. So, uh, so I hear, well, from everything that I've heard and been told by my stepfather, and <laughs> uh, air traffic control is can be one of the most stressful jobs out there. It has its moments. I mean, we, but if you as long as I've been doing it, you get in this comfort zone and it doesn't it doesn't bother you. I, I don't get flustered very often. It has to be something pretty serious. We we we're involved in a couple F sixteen crashes. That's probably the the worst it's been. But for the most part, you get in a groove. You, you know you know what you think's expecting to happen. So it it doesn't get overly overwhelming you know on, on a on a regular basis and i, I think the can, easiest way to describe that is uh, a lot of people like roller coasters a lot of people don't like roller coasters so the adrenaline rush you get from going down on a roller coaster when you're oversaturated in air traffic control you get that same adrenaline rush and i think that people call that anxiety and nervousness and the pucker factor but that's what people <laughs> that's what people strive for they want to get busy and that, that's the adrenaline ru rush they uh, live for yeah I'm really proud of these guys. I mean, they people don't see the work they do all, every day, right? And so they're on 24-7, 365. So when people are on Christmas leave, these guys are working. When they're on Easter, when they get, people have a four-day weekend, when the garrison commander, the senior commander graciously give out a 59, these guys don't get it, right? They're, no 59. They're, they're, they're working. Uh, they're on the shift. And when you get on an aircraft in Dallas and you get up beyond that five-mile ring that John and Corey were talking about, uh, your family's in the hands of these guys right here or, or Houston or Alexandria, wherever, right? Uh, but every month, you know, John or Corey will bring to my attention that these guys saved a civilian aircraft that was in distress. It's a n normal occurrence for them. And then when you listen to the tapes or read the transcripts that they've shared with me, uh, these guys are the calm voice to that guy that could be in, could be possible, is potentially in a life-ending situation for him piloting an aircraft right so that's pretty impressive they're they're the voice of calm and reason and they're they're walking a guy through a crisis to get him and whoever's in the aircraft to safety uh so they're they're doing their job and saving lives almost every every month you know? yeah i've heard some i've heard some stories about uh about our restricted airspace because i mean this is it's a military installation so you don't ha you can't just fly through it with with your flying car which i'm still waiting for like back to the future said 2015 we'd have flying cars and it's yeah it's almost 10 years and 
Where's my flying car? And my hoverboard. Five more years. Elon said he'll, he'll Google it. Yeah, they're works out for me. there. Yeah. <laughs> Could you imagine getting pulled over in a flying car? I get over to the cloud over there, man. <laughs> but um, I heard that there was a, there are some incidents. Um, like I, I heard about one. It was a private plane, uh, like just a small Cessna or something like that. They're all Cessnas and Pipers to me. I, I can't tell the, the small They're planes. All blips, uh, yeah. <laughs> But uh, they, it was coming in into restricted airspace, but there was like no contact with it. And there was like no radio contact. Couldn't get a hold of the guy or the pilot, whoever was flying. And he actually landed on our, uh, on our runway and the police were out there and everybody. And it turns out it was, um, it turns out it was like some, um, some radio problems or, or some guy that was lost. I was working the tower that day. I was a tra This was years ago. Ah, see, I've been here. A I've been here a while. So. This was probably 19 years ago, I think. Um, I was oh, actually wow. in the tower training at that time, <laughs> and uh, we got a. We never saw it coming inbound. Um, we were doing other work or whatever we were doing. I don't remember. And we had a, a call from operations said, "Hey, what's the uh, Cessna doing out on the ramp?" <laughs> no Cessna on the ramp. And we looked yeah. like, oh, there's a Cessna on the ramp. <laughs> never saw the guy, but he never called. We never had any anything on him. Just just somebody that was lost, huh? It, it was a bad day for him. Bad I guess. Day for us. <laughs> <laughs> so how far out does the, the radar go? So we, we actually cover, so to give you a perspective of our airspace, we go from Jasper, Texas, basically, to Natchez, Mississippi. So we have a huge chunk of airspace. Yeah, that's... And we um, have to have that. So when we decided, hey, we want to do the Joint Readiness Training Center, and we had to coordinate with Houston Center and say, hey, look, we'd like to get some delegated airspace. They said, okay, and we told them what we wanted to do. And they said, well, if you're going to do all that, we're not working it, so we're going to give you our sector. So they gave us their whole sector and said, it's now delegated to you. Here's your restricted areas. Here's your MOAs. And that's the area we work, and that's how we got the airspace that we have. And without that, so whenever we do decide, hey, look, we need to close down our facility, well, then everything stops. We have to give everything back to Houston. They take over the airspace. But our agreement is every restricted area, every MOA is canceled before that happens. Now, MOA is just a memorandum of agreement? Exactly. Yeah, no, okay. military operating area. Oh, military <laughs> operate. See, that's why I don't like the acronyms and the initialisms because, you know, you got memorandum of agreement, the military operating area. You got NBC, which means something completely different between the military and the <laughs> and the civilians. Yeah, you're thinking Lester Holt. We're yeah. not thinking that. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, no, I got to wear my mask. <laughs> so the... Um, how much equipment, or wait, no, you got all the way from Jasper in Texas all the way out to Natchez, Mississippi, and uh, that's pretty much the whole state, at least central and above. Yes. Um, but you have like major airport in between. Well, major, it's an international airport, AEX, uh, Alexandria Airport, International Airport. How, what kind of um, conjunction do you work with them if, if you have the control over everything, how, how do you split up the work? Well, uh, on inbounds and outbound, like five miles. So it, we, we're going to hand them off prior to them reaching their airspace. Or anybody that's coming to land in Alexander comes through us. We inbound them, coordinate with the tower, say, telling them know who's coming in. And then prior to them land, what, about seven to eight miles away from the airport, we switch them over to the tower. And the same way goes the other way. When they depart, they switch them to us. We talk to them after they depart Alexander, and then we hand them off, work them through our airspace. But we do that every day, all day long with, with Alex Tower. There's a lot of talking going lot on talking. when you're flying. A lot of talking. <laughs> so is it is how much different is it to, um, because we have all the helicopters here, how much different is it to deal with helicopters as opposed to uh, airplanes? Because I've noticed, I noticed some things with helicopters that really, really caught my attention or it, it just threw me for a loop is uh they they helicopters even without wheels just the skids on them they still taxi they still go down the runway and take off like a like why don't they just take off straight up i mean they're helicopters they, they do both they have to practice they do both they do taxi they do hover taxi the the i, I was here so long we used to have uh1s and the hueys used to do skid skid landings they used to have to practice that how to do a skid uh, so they they just got to practice different different configurations to depart and land, and to and to taxi. But they do they do, do they do both. They'll take off from from the taxiways at at uh, here on the airfield. They don't always go to the runway. 
Oh, okay. Yeah. And I can tell you, if we had a whole airspace full of nothing but helicopters, it would be nice. <laughs> because we can say, you know what, if you're saturated, everybody stop. <laughs> Hold right there. Stop and let's <laughs> let's start over. Yeah. <laughs> no more of the uh, no more of the the uh, what is it? Hold hold at twenty miles and <laughs> like it's, it's the mix is what makes it. You know we have the fast movers. We have regular civilian aircraft flying through. Then you have helicopters in the mix. It's just the mix of everything. And then on top of that, we also have uh, UAS is starting to take over and they're everywhere now. Between yeah, they, the large UAS to the small. Little off the shelf yeah. UASs. Yeah, so they'll have, they got a pretty complex airspace. I mean, so I've learned a lot about air traffic control. I'm not John or Corey by any stretch of the imagination, <laughs> but they've taught me a few things, right? So, I mean, they got a pretty complex airspace. So they're dealing with, you know, the, the, how, the fast moving aircraft, you know, attack aircraft. They're dealing with uh, uh, commercial airliners. They're dealing with the private, commer the private pilots. They're dealing with Army aviators. They're dealing with Air Force aviators. They're dealing with, not only all that stuff, but they're dealing with the, the Army, the military drones, what John's calling UAS. They've also, uh, we started working with balloons. Uh, so we've got balloons operating in that yeah, area. Yeah, I hear, I hear we get balloons over our country every once in a while. Not those kind of balloons. Oh, okay. <laughs> and if it was, I wouldn't tell you. <laughs> but uh, It was a weather balloon. <laughs> yeah. But they've got balloons. So they got a pretty complex airspace. So a controller that comes here will get some experience that he doesn't get anywhere else in the country, I think. A guy leaves here. And he's pretty. He's a he's a trained uh, he's a trained guy. We want to keep a guy that comes here, uh, and a guy comes here, and they've got a great work culture down there. I mean, this is these guys are like a little family, right? I mean, they got guys that work certain shifts, and they'll come in, and they and they work really well together. They get to understand everybody's everybody has strengths and weaknesses, you know, and they know when to compensate for those. And uh, great supervisors know know what to look for in each other to make sure that the flying public is safe. Uh, when I think what everybody should understand is that when you get on an aircraft, and you're talking to somebody from Fort Johnson, uh, your pilot has talked to somebody at Fort Johnson, that they're in good hands. They, these guys are well-trained and they do their job well. They've been in a long time and they've got a heck of a certification program. I mean, they don't put somebody in the tower by their self controlling aircraft or, or their approach control until that person is well-trained, fully certified, uh, probably one of the best certification programs in the, in the army. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> now the, uh, how, how much training do you have to go through to be, uh, uh, an air traffic controller. Well, to start with, you got to either the FAA or the military is the two best ways to to become a controller. You got to go to the tech school, Air Force or Navy, Marines. They all have their school. So, I think the Air Force is like four months long, four or five months long, just the technical training before they get assigned to a base. And then it all depends on the the person and the the complexity, the complexity of the the traffic and airspace that they got to deal with. Oh, wow. When I was in the Air Force, it took me at least a year once I got to my first facility because we had like 18 positions you got to get rated in. So there's a training agenda for each one of those positions that you have to fully master before you could work. So it just it just depends. But, I mean, you're looking probably like three years before you could be for, fully certified. And the FAA is a lot more stringent. There's, there's a pathway to get a job with the FAA off the street, but it is – it is a lot more stringent, a lot more steps involved in, in that because you got to go through the schoolhouse, which is at Oklahoma City. Then then you go to the facility, you got to go through that training program. Yeah, I was going to say that uh, uh, when I went through school, uh, the air traffic controllers, when I had the choice between becoming air traffic controller or being maintenance, I picked the wrong one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> air traffic controllers, it, it was I would have to be away from work for a year before I could even come back to work let alone go back to the unit so that's crazy i mean well not only that so even after you get your ratings at your first base that you're at every new base you go to training starts all over again because every, every facility has a whole new set of frequencies a whole different layout of airspace different airports you have to learn all the approach charts to so it's a never-ending schooling for air traffic control gotcha now uh I would imagine that uh, USA Jobs is the way to go if, you, if you're an air traffic controller already and you've got the experience and can get the job. Uh, USA Jobs, you don't actively recruit, walk, go out and look for people. You're, you're doing it the, the way the rest of the government jobs are. Correct. Right. So are there a lot of, is there a lot of uh, openings here or is this a pretty tough place to, no, to no. get into? So right now we do have quite a few openings. Um, we even have... Uh, five, well, I think we just picked up two, but we have five more term positions that we have here, which 
can exceed, they, they can be extended up to eight years as a term, and those can also be converted as a permanent as we lose people, we have attrition here. So um, we do have quite a bit of controllers that are available. But yeah, USA Jobs is definitely the route to go. It's, that's where you're gonna, we're gonna pick you up at. Yeah, I saw some, I, that's why I was asking, I saw some, and uh, also the, uh, the unit, the National Guard unit over at, uh, Air, uh, at Alexandria, at the 259th Air Traffic Control Squadron, they've got, um, they help out in the tower there. That's where they work. And then all of the, the equipment, the mobile equipment that the guard works on is all the mobile equipment. Mm -hmm. So they get, they have a little mobile tower that's on the back of a Humvee. Mm -hmm. They got a attack N, which is a bulldog. And uh, that's, that's a big trailer. And then they've got the radar that can go and apparently they're going to be getting the, uh, the mobile ILS, which is pretty cool. Do we have the, uh, I imagine that there's the, uh, we've got all, all of those, all that special equipment here also. So we, we have a, a, what we call a PAR. It's a precision approach radar and we're, it's currently down right now, but, uh, we do have that here and that's our, basically our ILS. It, it's same, it'll get you down to the same, uh, limits during inclement weather. Uh, that's being decommissioned by the Army, so we're in the process of eventually getting an ILS installed here. So we don't have the ILS yet, but we're looking to get it, I think, 20, Mark, when is it, 2028? Yep, 28. 28, we're supposed to get the ILS installed here. Alexandria does have an ILS, so we do have a lot of approaches being run over at Alex for ILS, especially for student pilots that need their training. Or when we have inclement weather and they can't come here, if our PER is down, Alexandria will be their alternate. That's very yeah. cool. John has got a great... Um, they set up a great training program, like he was talking about the extra training. So, a guy comes off the street. We hire a new a new uh, tra air traffic controller. Um, you know, it could be before they are allowed. Before they're going to Corey's going to allow him to sit in a seat by himself and control traffic. You know, uh, alone and unafraid by uh, by himself. Uh, he's going to have to go through you know six to eight months, maybe a year. It depends on the individual uh, where they're training that guy to make sure he's went through no matter where he come from he could come from jfk airport it doesn't matter he's going to have to learn the nuances of this uh airspace yeah we're not we're not like new york no. but he's doing things here <laughs> that he didn't do in new york exactly. and it's new air it's new terrain right yeah. new, new airspace terrain so he's got to learn that and they're, and they're pretty stringent about that not everybody makes the cut you know that's why uh that's why they we want to make sure it's safe uh, like i said our main priority is the uh, one preserving our mission capability and then two you know the flying public safe the safety of the flying public well that's why we win the fight for talent that's right yes uh, speaking of that talented people that's a great thing to talk about is uh so every one of these guys you know there's a lot of there's a lot of bennies uh, of being an air traffic controller one is they get early retirement lucky i want to retire but they earned that <laughs> Because if you've ever done shift work, uh, oh, yes, it, uh, they earn that, right? <laughs> so uh, especially when you're, you're running, we don't have enough air traffic controllers. We're not authorized enough air traffic controllers to do the mission we have, right? So that puts a strain on these guys. And if I thought scheduling uh, 911 operators and walk guys was tough. I don't even want to look at their board when they try to schedule because there's laws. They, these guys can only work so many hours per day, per week without oh, like, a break, right? Oh, so, so like the like pilots, you have to have yes, crew exactly, 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 exactly like that. thing. And and if we don't abide by that, we're breaking we're breaking federal law, right? So uh, I don't even like looking at John's board to figure figure out how he's doing that, right? So it, it's tough. Uh, but they also they get a retention bonus. We just got that authorized. It's a pretty good uh, chunk of change. I was wondering why Mike's been working here for so long. Yeah, <laughs> they, but they earned every dime of that. Uh, it was a big victory. I was so happy we were able to get that for them. And then uh, MCOM just authorized a special salary rate increase for these guys. Uh, which oh, nice. Is, uh, well overdue and 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 well deserved. Uh, so uh, they make some pretty good. Uh, if you can make the cut, it, it's pretty good. It's pretty good money now. You know they're they're sitting in a dark room up there looking at blips on a screen all day. So you earn that. And they're you go up there. I feel inadequate because they're pre all pretty smart. Uh, they show me something on a screen and I act like I don't. Um, yeah, I know. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, it's uh, a blip. They're, they're they're pretty smart. <laughs> yeah, it's been jammed. And we're not all in. The, we're not all in the dark room either. We do have the tower flowers. We call yeah. them, our, and we got the radar mushrooms. And <laughs> yeah, the, the tower guys are the most in shape. Uh, because they don't have they don't have an elevator oh, and no, to climb they, that no. tower. You should come up there sometime. No, Jeff. I've been I've been to the Alexandria Tower. It's it, the elevator, elevator only goes no, it only goes up so high, <laughs> right. and then you have to walk up the rest. 
They made me climb up the outside. I don't know why. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they didn't want you in there. I guess not. Maybe, Maybe we have an outside you. ladder on ours, too. We'll show you. <laughs> yeah. Come visit that tower sometime. You know, they're, they're all a, a bunch of great fellows, and they do good work for us. And some I some other benefits, Mr. Leslie didn't touch upon, we get we get shift differentials also. We get paid Sunday pay, extra extra working at night, holidays, because we don't get holidays off. We always, everybody has yeah. to work holidays. So we get extra pay just for stuff like that. Nighttime differentials. Yes. Yes. A Sunday premium and a holiday premium. Nice. Well, uh, yeah, holiday, sh y it better. Yeah. You should. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what is that? It, well, that's normal holiday pay for a government employee. And it's confusing to pay. When yeah. you put your time card in, if your holiday falls on a Friday, well, you didn't work the Friday. Your last day was a Wednesday. Well, Wednesday is a holiday. And they're saying, wait, that wasn't the holiday. But I worked 40 hour a week, so the Wednesday's my holiday. Yeah. So it, it, it's weird to pay, but that's kind of off topic. Yeah, they've made me read regs for that before. <laughs> I've had discussions. Corey's called me up and said, No, you're wrong. Yeah, you and I'm like, uh, I don't think I'm wrong. Then I had to go back and read it, and I'm like, Okay, I was wrong. I think okay. I left yeah. the room during that conversation. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I had to I had to figure out the, uh, the hard way about the nighttime differential. It's not for me, <laughs> it's, for, it's for you guys. It's like, Oh, man. <laughs> the old saying about, Guys who quote regs usually have never read it. it does not apply to these guys. Um, <laughs> they've actually read it and understand it. So yeah, that's what that's what I keep telling people is. Um, I tell people it's like if you're going to be held to the rules, you better know them <laughs> because right. you can quote them back to most people that are trying to hold you to the rules. They don't know them as well as you do. That's right. No, yeah, I've learned a few things. <laughs> <laughs> so what was the, what's the, well, I've, I've heard some stories, some really cool stories, especially with the radar. Um, like this one time it was um, an SR-71 was flying through their, uh, their radar and they, it showed up and they were told it's going to be coming, but you never saw it. <laughs> but the blip showed up on one side of the, the screen and the next time the radar swept around, oh. it was it was like almost off the screen on the other side. And I said, how wide is that radar? Uh, they can't talk about that, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> so I won't have you talk about it. That's why I can talk about it because I didn't see it. <laughs> anyway, so what's the uh, what's the the biggest aircraft that you've seen come through uh, Fort Johnson? Through our airspace or land on our runway? Uh, either one. So Corey, I believe you were working the day the space shuttle was jumped on the back of a seven forty seven. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's the biggest we've seen. The heaviest. Mm -mm. No, uh, you've seen uh, bigger. The Antonov uh, yes. one twenty four and the two twenty. They've they've been to Alexander and flown through our airspace. The two twenty came here the too. The big one, the two twenty four, yeah, has flown through. Oh. Which is gone now. Oh yeah, that, uh, one, yeah. So they, the one twenty four is the the biggest aircraft, but uh, we we see everything. I mean, when I say everything, everything. We Air Force One, Marine One. We worked. Uh, I mean, I, every every type of fighter you could think about has come through this airspace and worked here. It's B ones, B twos, B fifty twos, F twenty two. Yeah, F twenty twos, thirty five. All the F 15s, 16s, 18s. We, yeah, we see those a lot. A lot. Yeah. Now the uh, the one that really caught me off guard, and it people are they're gaslighting me on this one, because no, that's not possible. They didn't. I was um, I was in my yard out by the garden. And I hear this whine and I, it was familiar. So I look up and there was a C5 and I swear it couldn't have been more than, than a thousand, 2000 feet up. It was, it looked like it had just taken off and it was flying over my house, which is North of here. So it's like, but we don't have, it may have been a C-17. It, no, it, no, I know my C5, plane. C-5 can't, can't come out at Fort Johnson. That's why I was, yeah. it looked like it was just hanging in the air and it, it and it flew over my house and turned and, and. Now they'll come and do uh, drops at Geronimo, that, LZ and the peace on LZ. Maybe it, that's it, what they yeah, did. That's probably what they did. But it was, it was huge and it was mm -hmm. slow. Mm -hmm. And it's like, dang, I want to fly those because they break down in all the coolest places. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the, uh, the from what I hear, the uh, flight engineers and the pilots say on the C five, it's like, oh, we're going to be stopping over in Guam. Oh, wait, that one piece that uh, that we can't fly without, uh, it's on special order, and we're going to need to stay there for a week or two. <laughs> it's like it happens in Hawaii too. It's amazing how these things break down in certain spots. Yeah, the army doesn't break down anywhere like that. <laughs> no, they 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 break down in. Um, on, on the airfield at home. So yeah, because you could stand or someplace like that. We break down where it's 20 below or something. <laughs> <laughs> I hear the, uh, I hear uh, there are some C-130s that have uh, 
skis on them so they can land in Antarctica. Yeah, I've yeah. seen that. Uh, that's, I, I saw it on TV. We've got all kinds of uh, real enough nice stuff. I, uh, I would ask more about the International uh, Air Traffic Controller Day, but heck, I've, I've learned, uh, I learned everything I need to know. You guys need to be celebrated every once in a while. And, um, and while you're at it, uh, uh, appreciate the maintenance guys out there making sure you, the, your stuff works. Too. Well, they're part of this as well. We couldn't run <laughs> our right. operations without our maintenance guys. So when we celebrate... International Air Traffic Control Day, National Air Traffic Control Day, they're always a part of it. I mean, they're part of air traffic control. Okay, so as long as we don't put the ER at the end. And yes, so we'll let you in. It won't be the operators. It'll be the, uh, it'll be the whole squadron. That's right. <laughs> yeah, so the, yeah, so the airfield, is, you know, we've got the operations branch. We've got the maintenance branch. We've got the air traffic control branch. And so the, uh, when we talk about air traffic control day, it is one well-old machine. and One couldn't operate without the other. That's awesome. You know, so they, they all operate together and they operate operate really well and they serve this this uh, installation, the Army, uh, good. Good. Yeah. And the Air Force. And the Air Force. And the civilians. Yeah. And Louisiana. And, That's correct. <laughs> And the crop dusters, Corey's and the crop dusters. Oh, the crop yeah. dusters. Yeah. But anyway, well, Mark, uh, Corey, John, I appreciate you guys coming in, and uh, I wish you a very happy international uh, international air traffic control day. No errors on twenty October on 20, this Sunday. Yeah, it's that's when this when this airs. This will be uh, premiering on uh, on the twentieth. So. We've got everything going on, and I appreciate all of you staying with us and, and watching all of our podcasts. Please subscribe, uh, hit the notification, leave a comment. Let us know how we're doing. Let us know uh, if you'd like to see something else or if you'd like to see uh, a specific uh, soldier in here, soldier, uh, specific MOS, job, uh, office, something like that. Let me know, and uh, be sure to keep watching, and we'll be uh, watching and listening at you later. That was easy.